you have a Bible, open it to the book of Psalms, Psalm 106. And after you get there, open it to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, New Testament, chapter 7. I'm going to look at those two scriptures and a number of other ones this morning. I've gone away from my normal three-point sermon, and I've got ten here. So, Steeler game is until tonight, so don't worry. If the stomach crumbles a little bit, that's okay. If you need a Bible, slip up your hand, and Pastor Dave will get one into that hand so you can follow along. And uh, I, I'm going to ask you for your prayers for something very special uh, that I am humbled by the opportunity to be able to do. And um, how, how can I say it? I'm not scared. I, I, I'm not anxious. But I'm uh, because I'm humbled, I, I just feel like this is the, you know something big that the Lord has has given open the opportunity for, and that is um, the first weekend in December. Uh, I've gotten the opportunity, the invitation from the uh, Pittsburgh Regional Youth for Christ uh, Campus Life Ministry of Youth for Christ, which focuses on uh, high schools. And they have their, they call it the Fallout. It's the Fall Retreat, and it's out in Salt Fork, uh, Ohio, at the at the uh, state, uh, what is it, state park or yeah, state park out in Ohio. And it's a weekend, and they've asked me to come and, and be the keynote speaker for it, uh, which means I'll be speaking uh, Friday evening and then two times on Saturday and once on Sunday morning. Um, and it's an uh, incredible opportunity. Uh, they expect anywhere between 120 and 150 high schoolers, uh, probably half of whom are not believers. Many of them never you know, graced the door of a church before. They don't know anything about Christianity. So um, it's an interesting and, and awesome opportunity. I'm meeting with uh, one of the staff members. Hopefully, we've been going back and forth for the last uh, three weeks trying to get our schedules together. Now we're shooting for early Tuesday morning to just kind of, you know, talk about things. But it's, I mean, it's a done deal. That It's what, unless the Lord comes first, that's where I'll be uh, that weekend. And ask for your prayers. I really do, because it's an incredible opportunity I said at one point, I said, you know, in the planning and talking back and forth, I said, well, how how long, you know, how long should I speak? You know, what's the program uh, put together for? And the response was, well, how long do you think you can hold the attention of high schoolers? <laughs> I went, that's a really good question. <laughs> so uh, appreciate your prayers. Awesome opportunity. Awesome opportunity. In Luke chapter 7, starting to read at verse 36, we are given an indication of a principle of uh, life and of the kingdom. Chapter 7 of Luke, verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked him, meaning Jesus, to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his, feast, at his feet behind him, weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered. Now, I love that right there. Did you notice that this guy said it to himself? He's thinking this, and Jesus answers. I love that. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. 
And he said, you have rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven love, forgiven much, loves much. Forgiven a little, loves a little. Jesus' example is very good. If somebody, owed, two people owed you one five bucks and one five hundred bucks, you'd be looking for that five hundred bucks more than the five bucks, wouldn't you? And if you forgave both debts, you would expect the one whom you forgave owing you five hundred bucks, you would expect, you know, a little more response from them, like, wow, thanks so much. More love. We have been forgiven much. But here's what happens in our lives sometimes. We forget about that. We forget about how much we've been forgiven. And there's an important idea here that I want you to catch hold of as, as we look at Psalm 106. And that is, we have been forgiven. And Romans chapter 8 verse 1 is so important to think of when you think about the fact that you have been forgiven. Romans 8 1 says, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There's no condemnation. And so the whole exercise that we're going to see the psalmist does in Psalm 106 in thinking about the sins of Israel, it isn't for the purpose of condemnation. It isn't for the purpose of beating themselves over the head in all of the bad things that they did and feeling bad about it. It's important for us to walk in the knowledge that if your life is hidden in Jesus Christ, every sin, every, every, every single one is forgiven. It's forgiven. Here's the amazing thing to consider. God knew every single sin you would commit before you were created, before you were formed in your mother's womb. The sins that you have yet to commit, He already knows and has already forgiven them and is already working in you to use you in the kingdom of God in marvelous ways, knowing you're going to screw up. He knows that. So the idea of remembering what we have done wrong is not for the purpose like some might remember from growing up that some mom and dads have a habit of doing. Maybe you're in a relationship with a husband or wife where that happens. The old things that you've done get dragged up for the sole purpose of heaping guilt and condemnation upon you. That's human, not divine. Those are or what, that's what people do, not what God does. But there is a very good reason for remembering where we have come from. What God has forgiven us of already. Because it inspires in our heart more love for Him. More love for Him, remembering how much He's forgiven us of. Because you know what? I like to forget about how much God's forgiven me of. I like to remember how good I am now. Right? 
Oh, I, you know, I've got it pretty well together. I love the fact that last week the Lord unplanned, just put in my heart an, an admonition and an encouragement to everyone here to, you know what, let's be serious about about coming to church. Let's get here on time. You know, if you had a one-on-one -on -one appointment with God, uh, would you show up 20 minutes late? And, and I encouraged. And, and, uh, and then this morning... <laughs> Chris and I ended up being like 35 minutes late just because this thing happened and that thing happened. I'm going, oh, come on, I need to show everybody how I'm into this. I, I got this together. No, I don't. And God wanted to make sure that I knew that I don't. That it, it, it is in my weakness that His strength is made manifest. That's not to say... Okay, well, I will just accept my weaknesses then and live in them. No, that's not what that's about. What it's about is I don't need to walk as a believer in Jesus Christ with the cloud of condemnation following me like Job Befilksk. How many people know who Job Befilksk is? Any old people here? Wow, nobody. Ed, please help me here. I, I say that only because Ed and I are about the same age, and I'm thinking, wow, maybe maybe he's a lot younger than I am. There used to be a comic strip in the Pittsburgh Press back when there was a paper called the Pittsburgh Press, which was the evening paper, and Little Abner, that's right, that was the comic strip. And in that, there was a guy named Joe Befilksk. And whenever you saw him, he walked around and there was this black cloud with lightning and rain coming down that just followed him wherever he went, you know? And that's not how God deals with us in our relationship with him, with that cloud of guilt and condemnation following us around. If you haven't memorized Romans 8, chapter 1 yet, do it. Do it. And don't just memorize it to know the words. Memorize it so you can say it to yourself every morning when you wake up. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Wow. That's not freedom to sin. That's freedom to live without guilt, condemnation, and learn how to live without sinning. So now... Turn back to Psalm 106 with that as kind of an introduction to what we're going to look at in this psalm. Psalm 106 really talks about Israel forgetting forgiveness. Forgetting forgiveness. And we don't want to be in the same place. Psalm 106, we'll start reading at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He's good. For His mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all His praise? Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness at all times. Only one I can think of that fits that category is Jesus Christ. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. O oh, visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We've committed iniquity. We've done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea. The Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his namesake, that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words. And they sang his praise. And we'll stop right there. This is salvation shown. This is the demonstration of how God saves. This is the demonstration of how God continues to save. 